going to do this a little bit different than what you're accustomed to this afternoon. We as Lutherans usually wait for the pastor to get up on the pulpit and go for 15, 20, 25 minutes. Um, more recently, I've been in some services where it's gone 45. Not by me. Um, but sometimes it's a good idea to look at all the readings that are appropriated for a particular occasion and see how they all tie together. And that's, that's what I'd like to do today. The festival of Matthias is tied together in the Old Testament, the Gospel, and the Epistle reading. But we're going to begin in a little different order. We're going to begin with the Gospel reading. And the reason we're beginning with the Gospel reading is because it sets the stage about apostles. And Matthias is numbered as an apostle. You notice in the reading it says, in those days Jesus, first of all, begins his work that he's going to do with prayer. He's been facing some opposition. And the opposition is primarily coming from the would-be religious leaders around him who, who don't like his going out and preaching him and gathering crowds to himself. They want to end that. And they begin already early on in his ministry to how they're going to eliminate him. And in the process of that, Jesus goes to the mountain to pray. And we wish we had all the times that he prayed marked down and what the words all were, but we do have a couple, don't we? We have the fact that he teaches his disciples how to pray because they have seen him pray. And he institutes for them a prayer that we know by heart, the Lord's Prayer. But we can also go to the Garden of Gethsemane, can we not? And there we hear Jesus praying, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but your will. And the answer comes in the form of angels who come to minister to him. There are other occasions, however, like this one, where we don't have the words that we would like to know. When Jesus takes the bread and the wine at the supper institution of Holy Communion, he prays, but we don't have the words that he prays. When he's looking at Jairus' daughter, he prays, but we don't have the, the, the prayer that he offers, but the answer to the prayer. Here we have Jesus beginning a new phase of his ministry. And as he begins that new phase of his ministry, particularly working close with whom he's going to designate as apostles, he talks to the Father about the situation. And in the morning when the disciples, the followers, have gathered together, he proceeds to do no doubt what he had talked to the Father about. He designates some of his followers as apostles. So we have two classes of individuals who are really one and the same. They are first of all disciples. And disciples could be any number of people that follow Jesus. On one occasion, he sends out as many as 70 to go and tell the various communities around them that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When we read about what happens in the book of Acts concerning Matthias, we're going to find out that there's 120 that have gathered together. How many are sitting around him on this particular occasion, we don't know. But among all of them, he singles out 12 individuals. And he's now going to name them as apostles. Whereas disciples means a follower or a student of, the Greek word apostelos, apostle, is a, two, is a compound word, two words put together. Apo means from or out. And stello means I send. So an apostle is one who is sent out with a particular message to proclaim. And Jesus now singles out some individuals to be apostles. In the Bible class we were looking at this morning, this afternoon, we were reminded of the fact that it is Christ who gave some to be prophets and priests. But he also gave some to be apostles, pastors and teachers who teach. There are a limited number of apostles that the church has had over the years. We're going to look at the names of the first 12. One of them, we of course, is going to not want to continue in that ministry. And the festival of Matthias introduces us to that new one, the 13th. The 14th is the one we refer to as the Apostle Paul, who, like the others, is singled out in a direct way. The point being that these apostles were individuals that were handpicked directly by Jesus for their assigned task. Okay? 
The church today, as we're going to see when we look at the Acts account, does not do election of pastors and teachers in the same way. We use the Lord's blessing and guidance to do it, but the Lord is involved in an indirect way through his church. So looking at the uh, apostles, the original 12, notice how the order that's given. Simon, whom Jesus later calls Peter. And we probably know most about him because of his actions as a person who oftentimes would put his mouth into motion before his mind was in gear. He would be the one that would criticize Jesus when Jesus talks about going up to Jerusalem, that he's going to suffer and die. And Peter says, no, don't talk about that. And Jesus has to remind him, you have in mind the things of Satan, not the things of God. But Peter's also the one that we're going to hear about on the day of Pentecost when he stands up and gives instructions for the election of Matthias. And Peter's going to be the one that would also write his epistle, especially calling our attention to the time when he, along with James and John, were on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, who is called, or Simon, who is called Peter the Rock, upon whom, whose faith the church is built. But another interesting fact that we know about Peter that is not specifically mentioned in the scriptures concerning the others is that Peter was a married man. Jesus goes into his home and heals Peter's mother-in-law. The next one we have is Peter's brother, Andrew. And it's interesting that Andrew finds Jesus first and then goes to visit with his brother, Peter, and says, we have found the Messiah. It takes Peter to meet Jesus. Andrew we know little about from the scriptures, although we know from church history that he's an individual that um, traveled a lot in his ministry and may also have been one that, he, that died of a martyr's death, hung on a cross, not in the form of what we're familiar with, but on a cross that was in the shape of the letter X. And the Andrew cross is today embodied into national flags. And I believe one of them is the flag of one of the Scandinavian countries, I believe it's Denmark. But the Andrew Cross is also embodied into state flags. For example, Alabama, Andrew. Uh, also a fisherman from Galilee in the north. James and John are another pair of brothers. We know concerning James and John that they were the two that accompanied J Peter when they went to the Mount of Transfiguration or to the home of Jairus and saw the resurrection. James, this particular James, is one that is first martyred. And his martyring takes place early on in the book of Acts. And we ha hear how Herod martyred him, had him beheaded. And then when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he quickly arrests Peter also. But the angel comes and lets Peter out of the jail at night. Both James and John were also fishermen from Galilee. And we do know that their parents by name. The father was a man by the name of Zebedee. And their mother was, a na was named Salome. S-A-L-O-M-E. Um, John is the one who hears a distant relative in the John the Baptist point to Jesus and says, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he leaves John the Baptist to go and follow Jesus. He's the one disciple that church history tells us died a natural death, probably around the year 100 at the age of 100. And you can go and visit in the city of Ephesus in modern day Western Turkey, supposed house where he lived along with Mary, Jesus' mother. Because it is this John who's at the foot of the cross and hears Jesus speak to him, behold your mother. And as he speaks to Mary, behold your son. And John took her into his home. He's the author of the gospel that bears his name. He's also the author of three epistles, short little letters towards the back of our New Testament. And also the book of Revelation, which he writes on the island of Patmos, which you can visit in the Aegean Sea off the coast of Egypt. Philip, also a follower of John the Baptist. He also heard John point to Jesus as the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Philip is mentioned at the feeding of the 5,000 when Jesus talks about feeding them. And he says, we have only these few loaves of bread and these small fish. Beyond that, we know little about Philip. 
Bartholomew has another name by which we know him, namely Nathaniel. He's from Cana in Galilee, whereas the others are from Capernaum, the seashore. Uh, he's introduced to, Je to Jesus by Philip. Um, and he sees the omniscience of Jesus. When Jesus sees him coming, Jesus points to him as a, as a righteous man um, in whom there is no condemnation. And it startles Bartholomew to the point that um, he follows, follows Jesus. Um, Matthew is first introduced to us as Levi, a tax collector. However, not in the sense of being a publican. The, the publican tax collectors were the individuals that were uh, in contract with the Roman government. And the publicans were the ones that would set up toll booths along the way and they would charge you for walking on the street carrying a load to the marketplace and then they would charge you again on the way back. They were the ones that were ruthless about taking over people's property. Matthew seems to have been, as Levi, a customs official who very likely stood at the border between Palestine and the country to the north, namely Syria, and collected the appropriate customs, much like our customs officials do today. Um, he's also considered to be a first cousin of Jesus in that his mother and Mary, Jesus' mother, may very well have been sisters. Uh, his work after um, the, the uh, story of Pentecost is noted in history as taking him to North Africa, where he primarily works among the Hebrew people. And his epistle or gospel, the oldest one in the New Testament, which bears his name, is written primarily to Hebrew people to remind them of, of the greatness of Christ. Uh, Thomas, the doubter, the one who says, I won't believe unless I can see and touch, is the one who declares on the day, second Sunday after Easter, uh, this is my God and my Lord. And, and beyond that, we really don't know a whole lot about Thomas. James, there's another James, not the same one as we talked about earlier, but this is James, the son of Alphaeus, um, his, which is a father's name. And Mary is his mother's name. He's also sometimes referred to as the less. And there's uh, consideration given to his why is he considered the less, and some think that it might have been that he was the shortest in stature. Of the, of the 12 apostles, um, also, or also maybe the youngest. Uh, Peter is usually considered to be the oldest. And then you have Simon, who is the zealot, or the zealot. Uh, there's consideration that this may refer to a band of a uh, group that was very zealous about their homeland, but it's more, more emphasis is placed on the fact today that this Simon was one that was very enthusiastic about his relationship with Jesus. Um, it's said that he worked in North Africa and then may also have traveled as far away as the British Isles. Judas, the son of James, not the same James that we mentioned here. You'll notice that James is a very popular name. There's a James that also appears in the list of Jesus' brothers later on, which is going to be the one who authors the epistle of James. So a very popular name, as is and by the way, this one we have little information about. And then finally, Judas Iscariot. Uh, both these gentlemen, the name Judas ha is the Greek derivation of the Hebrew word Judah. And we anglicize it in our Bibles in that we have the book of Jude. Same name. But the book of Jude is usually considered to have been written by one of Jesus' half-brothers. And Judas, of course, is the one who betrays Jesus. Now, what stands out when you look at all these individuals? I think the one thing that stand out, stands out to me when I think of the apostles, chosen from among the disciples, the followers, they're common, everyday fellows. There's not a one of them that has a doctoral degree in anything. At best, they were trained fishermen or tax collectors. And yet Jesus calls them one by one into a special service and a special ministry. He does the same thing, but indirectly, as we're going to see in a moment. After the they are the disciples, and this event takes place between Ascension Day and Pentecost. 
Remember on Ascension Day or shortly before it, Jesus had told his disciples to go to the city and wait until the special gift that they're going to receive. And that happens on Pentecost 10 days later after the Ascension. And in that particular time frame is what we hear this, this story taking place, okay? And the city, of course, is Jerusalem. They went to the upstairs room where they were staying. We're not sure if it's the same upstairs room as where they celebrated communion or not. But notice now who's there. Peter and John, brothers, were there also James and Andrew, brothers, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. Missing, of course, is Judas Iscariot, which we'll hear about in a moment. All of them kept praying together with one mind. They had the same faith, the same confidence, the same trust and they kept expressing it. We wonder how this prayer circle worked. Did they take turns one after the other? Um, we're not sure, but the fact is that they were united in prayer, confession of their faith. And along with them were the women. There are numerous times in the scriptures and the gospels where we hear about women also that traveled with Jesus. And there are at least one that is mentioned as being rather financially well blessed that she contributes to the well-being of Jesus and the disciples. Um, and then also notice who's also mentioned specifically Mary, the mother of Jesus and with his brothers and the his has to be Jesus and the brothers can refer to the matter of we are brothers and sisters in the faith. But notice that these others have been already mentioned, so the more likelihood is that this is a reference to the brothers that were children of Mary and Joseph. And in one of the Gospels, they are named specifically. There are five, I believe it is, altogether, plus sisters, which is in the plural. Mary and Joseph had other children after Jesus was born. So among those days now, when the group numbered about 120, Peter stood up among the brothers. And this in no way infers that Peter is taking some kind of leadership position. It may very well be that what they are going to talk about has been discussed and they ask Peter simply, well, you get up and talk. Maybe he had the most booming voice. Most likely the oldest. And so they ask him to get up and be the one who stands up and talks to the group. And he says, brothers, gentlemen, brothers, Scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David about Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. Judas was counted as one of us and was given a share in this ministry. One of us because he was one of the original 12 apostles. But notice what else Peter is saying here with regard to Scripture. His position on the truth of scripture being given by the Holy Spirit. It's remarkable to me that when this takes place is only a little more than a month after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Where do we find the disciples on Easter Sunday? Where do we find Peter on Good Friday? Cursing and swearing, he doesn't know who Jesus is. And he goes out and he whips bitterly because he sees Jesus and he's reminded of the warning that Jesus had given him. On Easter, he and the others are locked up in the upper room. A week later, they're still there, even though they've seen Jesus. And a few weeks later, Peter stands up and boldly confesses, the scriptures said this and it was fulfilled. There's a remarkable awareness, a remarkable faith awakening that has taken place in Peter and no doubt in the others also that has taken place as they, these things are revealed to them and their understanding is open. No longer are they the ones who walk along the road to Emmaus and wonder what's going to happen and they're downcast until Jesus reveals himself to them. It's remarkable how their faith grew. And the quotations that are going to be quoted here from David are all quotations that come out of the different, uh, a number of different psalms. Now this man, Judas, acquired a field with what he has, was paid for his wicked acts because remember when he takes the money to the temple and throws it in, I, I betrayed innocent blood. They said, well, we can't put this blood money back in the treasury. So they went out and bought the potter's field. 
um, where, where Judas was eventually buried. The middle burst open and all his intestines spilled out. He hung himself and evidently the rope was not strong enough. This became known to all the residents of Jerusalem and so in their own language that field was called Akadama, which means the field of blood. Indeed, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his residence be deserted, let there be no one dwelling in it, and let someone else take his possession, his position. Therefore, on the basis of what scripture has said and what scripture has been fulfilled, we need to do something about it. It is necessary for one of the men who accompany us from us during the entire time that Jesus went in and among us, beginning from his baptism by John until the day Jesus was taken up from us, become a witness with us of his resurrection. Notice that when they're looking to replace Judas, they have qualifications that they place on the individual who's going to take his place. It's going to be an individual who has been with us from the beginning, from the beginning of Jesus' ministry, from the time he was baptized. It's telling us a lot, isn't it, about the people that were around the baptism of Jesus and heard the heavens open and saw that dove descend on Jesus and heard John point to him as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. They were individuals who were numbered among the 70 who went out and did as Jesus said when he sent them to proclaim that the kingdom of heaven is end. They weren't newbies. They were people who knew what they had seen and heard and could testify as witnesses. They set qualifications. Okay? And what do they do? They propose two. Joseph calls Barn um, Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. Then they pray. And look at what we have here. The words of their prayer. Lord, you know everyone's heart. That's a bold confession too, isn't it? You know everyone else. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take the place of this apostolic ministry from which Judas turned away to go to his own place. They rely on the indirect connection of Jesus with their hearts to lead them in the selection of the new apostle. And so the original 12, we talk about the direct selection of the apostleship. In this case, we talk about the indirect. So the same thing in our church today. When we come to time for electing a, a pastor, the district president sends us a list, and we look at the list and cast a ballot. We vote. Which one, Lord, do you choose? And he leads and directs our hearts we become the indirect ones that serve as his instruments. A fitting and orderly process to go about. Some of the things we do in the church might seem old, antiquated, but they're biblical. And they do work. Because look at what happens. Then they assign lots to them. The lot fell to Matthias, so he was counted with the 11 apostles. How they went about casting the lot has been something that's been discussed among Christians for a long time and probably will go on for a long time. Whether it was a ballot system similar to what we're, like, we're used to doing, some suggest it was a matter that there were two stones that were put into a pot and they threw the pot and drew it around and around until one of them popped out. Some suggested that there's maybe two scroll, four scrolls and on one of the scrolls, was written the name of each individual. So it would have been the, the name of the first man, Justice, and the other, Barth, um, um, Matthias. And then the second one, in the other pot was two, two scrolls. On one was written the word apostle, and the other one was blank. And as they drew one out, they drew one out, and it said to Matthias, and they drew out the other one, and it said apostle. Not sure. I, I tend to lean more towards the idea that there was some way in which maybe with stones, maybe with paper, they cast a ballot because it says, you know everyone's heart. The people took part in this election. And yet the Lord was the one that was indirectly guiding their hearts and his will to be performed. The numbering of the 12 is now back to 12. Matthias, the one whom the Lord blesses, 
becomes that 12th apostle. And we don't know a whole lot about him beyond this. Um, some consider that he possibly went into what is now modern day West, North, East Africa, um, possibly in the same area that the Ethiopian eunuch had come from. Not necessarily Ethiopia as we know it today, but that region of Africa. But church history also tells us that unfortunately, like so many of the other apostles, he died a martyr's death. But as we're going to see in a moment, whose church is it? It's the Lord's church, isn't it? And they relied on him to lead them in their decision. Might we have the same faith and confidence in, in our God? I bring in the last reading, the first reading last, because it underlines the fact that when we're talking about the workings of the church and how things happen in the church, in the body of Christ, in the body of believers, whose church is it? Um, we, we erect buildings and we gather together in buildings. We do various different things and functions. But ultimately, the church is the person, the people. And they're the ones that through their trust and their confidence in that creator, savior, sanctifying God, are blessed. And notice how the Lord talks to us about that fact in this reading from Isaiah. Notice he begins by saying, Isaiah records these words. This is what the Lord said. And then he's going to tell us something that the Lord said. And notice what happens at the end of verse 2. Declares the Lord. You get bookends. Right? You get bookends that says this is what the Lord says. And notice what the Lord says about himself. Heaven is my home. And notice this heaven. <laughs> we talking about Larry, with Larry earlier. Heaven is my home, my throne. And the earth is my foot still. He's the one that made it. Do you ever think of the earth as the Lord's footstool upon which he rests? Humanly speaking terms, right? The Lord doesn't really have big feet like that, or it would push it down. But the point being is that the earth is beneath him, isn't it? And all that's in it. Um, where is the house you will build for me? A house had been built for God by Solomon. 300 years earlier. It falls into disrepair and they have to rebuild it and all of that. And by the time Jesus comes, the temple that they're worshiping at in Jerusalem is not any resemblance of the one that was built by Solomon, nor are the rocks that they go to today and put their little pieces of paper in. Not one stone was left in upon another when Jerusalem was destroyed. But the point is, is that if you're going to have a place that you zero in and say, this is only where the Lord is, the Lord says, I'm too big for that. But yet it's fitting for us to have a place like this for worship because it gets us together to celebrate with one another and to share. Um, where will my resting place be? There's not one single place because the Lord has everything. Has not my hand made all these things? And so they came into being. And, and when we think of the Lord talking in the way he does, he's emphasizing to us his characteristics. And I would share with you just a couple of them. I oftentimes think of the omnipotence of God. Those are the omni words, all powerful. And we talk about the almighty God who is the creator of heaven and earth. We talk about the omniscience of God, the all-knowing God. He, he's the one that saw Bartholomew coming, Nathaniel coming, and said, there's the no, right, no, no, vile, no guile in that man. And how often he could tell the other people around him what they were thinking even though they didn't speak. And he knows all things too with regard to us, doesn't he? He knows what your individual needs are. He knows that your individual need is to be assured of the forgiveness of sins that has been won for you by Christ's suffering, death, and resurrection. He knows the things that you need for being strengthened in your faith and lifted up in your life. And he comes and nourishes you individually and collectively with his word, doesn't he? Hear the word from the called servant. Your sins are forgiven. You are a child of God. Take and eat. Take and drink. Receive the sign of the cross on the head and on the heart that you are baptized a child of God. And then comes the sanctifying work of that Holy Spirit who having, knowing that we were dead in our transgressions and sins has called us to life and faith in him. Omnipotence, the power of God. 
Someone reminded me in 1994 when we had the devastating earthquake rather than how much fell apart. The omnipotence of God. What did we see last Sunday just before we started worship? The beautiful rainbow that filled the sky with a reminder of his promise. The omniscience of God. He knows me by name. He knew the hearts of those individuals in the city congregation of Jerusalem and he knows the hearts of each of you. And he knows the need that you have as a congregation here in Calvary Canyon country. And he still shares with you the power of the word. Um, so the, the omnipotence, the omniscience, The holiness of our God, they're all in that little expression of what he says about himself. And we bow in confidence before him as the congregation in Jerusalem. You know what we need, Lord, answer our prayer. Um, we can be assured that Matthias and the other 11 disciples who became apostles went on with that kind of faith and that kind of confidence. We may not know a lot about their details of life after they became apostles. We know nothing about Matthias for sure. Maybe that's okay. Because their emphasis was never on themselves. Their emphasis was always on the one who had called them to the position that they had. The emphasis was on the position of, on the one who has called you from the darkness of unbelief to life in his name. It's on and all about Calvary and the one who lived and died there for you. For Jesus is that Savior. Amen. <laughs>